Good, good morning. Um, it, it, it's great to be here uh, with you uh, this morning uh, to talk about um, this topic of the divorce. And, and one thing that I want to share with you before I um, start and read uh, Matthew chapter 19 is that, uh, you know, after the first service, um, I, I felt that what, what I said and, and the time that I spent, I spent uh, approximately 30 minutes speaking um, about this topic, and I just felt like it wasn't enough. Um, that truly this has to be a, a conversation that goes beyond this room. Um, I, I will speak, I will try to be clear in what the Bible says about divorce, because uh, I want scripture, I want God to speak and speak authoritatively about this topic rather than the culture or what is the norm um, you know, uh, at this time. Uh, I want to do that, but I also know that um, a topic like divorce, it gets really messy. Um, the application uh, becomes a little fuzzy, and there is no way that I can stand here before you and say that I understand. Um, I understand the feelings that come about with a divorce, um, whether you are a child or whether you are an adult, whether you're going through it, whether you've been thinking about it. I, I can't... Um, empathize in terms of uh, what you feel. I can sympathize with you, and I can share with you what the Word of God says, but I, I want to encourage you that after um, this time here, as you hear the testimony, that, that, that you speak um, to you know, the pastors or, or, or just people in general, to, to, because we really want, um, like I said, the, the Bible and God to be the final authority of, of, above all other things. So with that in thought, um, I, I know that I have a different audience here. There's Catapult Kids here. Uh, but even this topic, it really separates, like, the, the quote, the audience. You know, uh, and which I'm trying to be preventative in terms of, you know, don't get divorced. Um, also, I want to be redemptive. Um, what if you got divorced? Um, does Christ still love you? Uh, also, um, restorative, how do reconcile people together even after divorce or, or, or in, in situations. So there are different kind of audience, but I hope that the Bible does speak to all of you, um, and I will try my best uh, to do that. So let's go and open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. This will be our primary text, but we will look at a couple other texts um, this morning. So Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 9. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And a large crowd followed him, and he healed them there. And verse 3 is when uh, the Pharisees come and, and talk about divorce. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, um, we desire that the, that the word speak to us, um, that we submit to it. But Lord, um, as it speaks to us, I pray that it also will give us hope, um, that it will give us answers to un our questions, it would heal um, some of the brokenness that we have in our hearts, Lord. So we come to you humbly um, as we talk about this topic, and may you uh, bless us uh, as we honor your name by submitting to your word. We thank you, Lord, and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, before we go into Matthew chapter 19, here, uh, just a couple of things, the state of marriage and divorce uh, now, and and George Barna, who is a researcher, um, you know, specializing in religious things, um, he did, you know, 
research and surveys, and I don't want to you know, bore you with all of that stuff, but this is his conclusion about marriage and um, divorce. He says, marriage has shifted from being the cornerstone um, to the capstone of adult life. Um, he says later, that marriage now becomes only after they have moved toward financial and psychological independence. Meaning that before, the, the mar- before marriage was a cornerstone, you built your life on that, uh, but nowadays, uh, what people are doing is that they're building uh, their first, making sure that they're financially well, they're, they're secure, taking care of all the professional things. And after that, the marriage is just a capstone that goes on the top that builds the whole house. It's not the very cornerstone of your life. So it's a, it's a little different. Uh, and what, what, what that says is that um, in our culture right now, we have diminished marriage um, quite a bit. And I think when we diminish marriage and, and God's view of marriage, what happens is divorce really comes into the picture. You know, 33% of, and the number here is, uh, is a little fluid and go a little higher or a little less, depending on what data you look at. But about 33% of those who are non-believers um, say that they have at least divorced once in their life. Uh, but here's a, the shocking thing um, and the alarming thing for, for us is that uh, that survey that they did and the data that they gathered, they said that believers, born-again believers, have the same stat as non-believers. So believers actually have a 32% rate where they would get married and, and at least 32% of those who are born-again Christians who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has at least divorced um, once. So that means that whether you are a believer or non-believer, the, the, the marriage... Uh, And then your view of marriage is similar, where now becomes, or divorce becomes a natural part of your life. Nothing that should be, um, you know, said, this this cannot be part of my life. Divorce is not something that I I will put into my life and it will never happen. It's more like, well, you know, I get married, if I get dissatisfied or something happens, then I'm going to get a divorce. It's no, almost no big deal in, in one sense. And so that is pretty alarming for those who actually believe in the Bible because God, Jesus, says completely something else. And Matthew 19 is one of those passages where Jesus says, no, marriage is permanent. Divorce should not even come into the picture for those who believe in Jesus Christ. And these Pharisees, they came up to him, and they wanted to test him because there were two uh, points of view at that time. There are two famous rabbis, Shamel and Hill. There are two rabbis, and they had two opposing views. One was a little strict, limited in terms of divorce. Uh, only uh, some uh, grave uh, moral indecency is when you can get divorced. And the other, it seems like one of the more the popular one, was, was that you can get divorced for any reason. And there's some examples of, of people getting divorced for them coming home uh, and the, the food was burnt. Uh, and, and, there, and then be, just because of that, because they didn't like the food or what was prepared, they filed for divorce. And it was okay. Or if you're going home uh, on your way to work, whatever work that may be, going home, and you look at another wife or another woman, and that woman looks a lot better uh, than your wife at home, Right then and there, he could file for divorce, and it was okay. So there were two opposing views, but both of them said that divorce was okay. It was part of it. It was a natural part of life. And they wanted to test him to, to trap him. One was, if he said it was more strict, then he would be like John the Baptist, who, who, who preached against Herod's um, divorce and, uh, and, and remarriage, and he was beheaded for that. So he wanted them to get in trouble with, uh, with, with, with the Romans or, the, or Herod with the uh, ruling powers, or if he took the other side, the more lax um, view of uh, divorce and, or marriage and divorce, then he would get in trouble with a lot of the Israelites, the Jews, who thought that you know, it was a little more strict. Uh, and, so, but, and this is what Jesus does all the time. You know, they ask him a question and says, you're asking the wrong question. So he doesn't really answer their question. He tells them something else. And so it says, he answered... Because you would expect if they're saying, which one are you? Are you this or that? And, so, and you would think Jesus would say, I'm this or that. But he doesn't. He says, he answered in verse 4. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So instead of talking about divorce, 
he starts talking about marriage. See, the, the Pharisees wanted to know, uh, when can I divorce my wife? But Jesus says, no, no, I'm not going to talk about divorce. We have, to, we have to talk about marriage first. Because I believe his point was, if you understand marriage, then divorce is not something as an option for you right now. They wanted excuses to divorce and to break this marriage covenant. But Jesus is, gonna, is going to speak against that by talking about marriage. And so there are four things that Jesus talks about and four descriptions that he gives. Uh, and in verse um, uh, four, it says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The first thing that Jesus reminds the Pharisees, because they should have known this if they read the Bible, is that marriage is God's plan. It is his idea. It did not come after the fall to correct something. From the very beginning, in paradise, his plan, his perfect plan was male and female. They'll come together and get married. There will be two. There will not be two anymore. They will become one flesh. This was his idea. Second, it says that marriage is supposed to be permanent. If you look at verse 7, I'm sorry, verse 6. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. It was God's plan. It was God's idea in that idea, it was for male and female as they would get married, that it would be a permanent thing. That God is bringing two people together and man shall not separate it because God has put them together. You know, when you get married in, in a marriage ceremony, it's not about the husband and wife, you know, you know, getting married together. God has to be involved as believers. You have to believe as you get married, my husband and wife, that it is God's idea that you are married to your wife. And, that, and, and the same thing with the wife. The, this is the man that God wants me to marry. Not this is a man that I want to marry. That, hopefully that's part of it. Okay? I don't want to say that shouldn't be part of it. But you have to think, God wants me to marry this person because this person is going to help me be more sanctified. This person is going to help me to uh, glorify God more that God is involved. It is God's idea, and it is permanent. Because if God joins somebody together, and he is all-knowing, that means he knows all the faults. He knows all the faults of both, and he thinks them coming together is something that is good. Why should they separate? It also says that it is very, very intimate to becoming one flesh. It's not here and here, and they're getting married, and they stay the same. No, it's two becoming one. Remember, I was sitting um, with a couple doing uh, premarital counseling, and, and we were talking. And I had to gently rebuke them because they were talking about, yeah, we've already talked about how we're going to work our life after we get married. You know, I'm going to give 40% of my time to this, and he's going to give 60% to this. And so they kind of broke it down where there was 100% put together, meaning that I'll do a part, my husband will do a part, and we'll compromise and we'll move forward. Well, that's becoming two. Going into a marriage, becoming two, doing 40%, 40%. And I, I told them, well, you know what? That's really not what marriage is. It's a husband saying, I'm going to give my 100% to you, even if you give me zero. And a wife saying the same thing. I'm going to love you 100%, not 50%. I'm not going to love you if you don't do this. No, no matter what, I'm going in marrying you 100%. So it's 100 plus 100 equals 100. I know I'm a math guy. It doesn't make sense. But that's what marriage is. It's this, it's this intimacy. It's a mystery. Okay? But it's becoming one flesh. So if you become one and you separate that, it's not two people, now, two people coming in, two people are separating, but it's two people becoming one and then cutting that person in half. It's like death. Uh, that's how severe it was. And, and so, and, and lastly, Marriage is a covenant. God is a covenant God. God is a covenant keeper. And he chose, and if you look at Ephesians chapter 5, he chose 
marriage to reflect the covenant that he has with his church. He didn't choose, uh, you know, parent um, child relationship. He didn't choose friend friend. He he didn't choose that. He didn't choose, uh, you know, a pastor and and, and a congregator. He didn't choose that as the, the the thing that reflects the covenant that he has with his church. It is marriage that he chose. It says whenever you see a marriage, that is a picture of my love for you as a church. When you ever see a marriage, that's a picture of my sacrifice for the church. And so he, he said marriage is a covenant that reflects. And so those are the four things. And those are the, uh, the, the view that Jesus had in terms of, hey, this is marriage. And then when you bring divorce into that picture, it contradicts what God originally has set for marriage. You know, God says, it is his idea. I know both of you, and I'm going to bring you together. It's my idea. The whole concept of marriage is my idea. When you bring divorce in, you're saying, it's my idea. I'm, I'm going to figure out what's best for me. I'm going to do it. I'm going to end it whenever I want. It's my choice. Divorce contradicts. Um, not only the, the, um, the concept of God's ideas, but permanency. You know, it says what God has, you know, created or joined together, let man not separate. But man, by divorce, is saying, I, I'll end it. You know, when I don't feel like I love that person, I'm going to end it. You know, when I don't feel like, um, you know, if things are going right, I'm going to end it. You know, Jay um, Adams has this um, uh, funny story um, forget if it's in a book or, you know, it was in his uh, classroom. Uh, he, he is a, a pastor, also a counselor, um, and he was in a, in a marriage, uh, you know, um, a, a counseling session with, with this couple. And obviously they were going through marriage strife, and, and, um, and both of them didn't like each other. Both of them uh, basically, you know, told them, told, uh, you know, Jay Adams, honestly, hey, I don't, I don't love um, my husband. And my husband said, you know, I don't love my wife either. And we're having some really difficult time. And so Jay Adams, um, in, in his comical way, um, says, well, you know, do you guys live in the same home? Um, they go, yeah, yeah, same home. Um, you can, so you guys can say that you're, you're kind of neighbors? He goes, yeah, I guess so. Well, great. The Bible says love your neighbors. So you got to love your neighbor. All right? And so they're going on a little more and goes, and they're stopped. And they're saying, my husband does this. And the wife says, yeah, he does this. And so they're arguing. And the wife goes, you know what? I'll admit it. I hate my husband. He's like, a, he's like an enemy. He's like someone that I don't want to be around. And J.M. says, great. The Bible says, love your enemies. <laughs> and so his point uh, to them and to us is not, you know, you fall in love. No, it, it's permanent. The Bible commands, whether you feel it or not, the Bible commands to love your husband and love your wife. It's supposed to be permanent. It, you can't go by your feelings or certain situations. And also, there's, there's two uh, and one flesh. As I, as I mentioned, that divorce, what divorce does, is it brings that two, and, and you stay two. And you can't think that way as, as a, a married couple, that you are one flesh. And then obviously the, the marriage covenant. You know, I'll speak to this a little bit later. But divorce says that I can end this marriage. But if we reflects the covenant that God has with us, do you want Christ to really say, I can end my covenant with you at any time just because I don't love you anymore? Because that's the picture that you're showing to the world. So when you have a view of marriage that honors God, honors his word, honors each other, divorce cannot be an option in your marriage. But you know, God not only has a a view of marriage, but he also has a view of of divorce. If you look at Malachi chapter 2, 16, this uh, passage and the translation of especially verse 16 is a little bit controversial. Um, it, it does, some uh, scholars disagree on what it exactly says. The ESV in verse 16 says, For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her. The New American Standard and the New Living Translation um, 
says the same, the same verse 16. Well, ESV says, for the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, in verse uh, 16 of the New Living Translation, it says, for I hate divorce, says the Lord. Uh, so it looks like there is two different, but I'm not going to go into the debate here, but we, we know that God doesn't like divorce. <laughs> it, it's clear in the Bible. Even without this passage, from what I just said, we know that God doesn't like it. Okay? But can I just say, for the sake of, uh, God hates divorce. I'm going to use the New Living Translation. God hates divorce. And God hates divorce because he hates sin. And divorce is always a result of sin. You know, remember, marriage was done in paradise. It wasn't to fix something because of the sin that, were, that did when they were kicked out of paradise. It wasn't to fix anything. It was there before. And so divorce, the cause of the divorce is always a result of sin. Even, even when uh, Moses speaks about why did God, why did Moses give permission for a, a certificate of divorce? And Jesus' answer was it was because of the hardness of the heart. Uh, of man that he allowed divorce to happen and he hates a sin or he hates the consequence of divorce like I said I, I, I can't empathize I, I can't um, you know tell you that I can share you know sometimes the pastors want to feel like they can empathize and understand no we can sympathize we can preach God's word but sometimes we don't really understand the feelings and the destruction sometimes that, that, that goes on in your heart and in, in, in your world when, when something like divorce happens but God hates it. Look at what it says in um, Malachi 2, 13 and 16. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence. That's his language. It's, it's a violent act where there's destruction. Not that divorce is over, but it, there's destruction. There's a trail of destruction that comes after a divorce. And so he hates the way it tears families apart. He hates it. And I, I hope that you guys, um, that everyone in here understands God's view. God hates it. The way it speaks about his picture of, of, of his own covenant. You know, for especially for believers, believers are to reflect God's love, right? Believers are to, ref- and through marriage, reflect God's covenant with us. That a husband should lay down his life as Christ laid down his life for the church. That that the wife should love as as Christ loves the church. And that's a beautiful picture. And when, when, when especially believers get divorced, um, you know, when believers get divorced, it shows a picture of God's love in a distorted way. It slanders God's love or God's covenant with his people. So that being said, should I end the sermon here? Um, you know, I, I'm not going to, by the way. <laughs> because I, I think it then, if I did end it here, it leaves um, people with, 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 with a sense of, it, you know, like, that's it. God hates divorce, so therefore, if I got divorced, God would hate me. You know? If for no reason um, your, your spouse, you know, committed adultery and you got divorced, and I see it, God hates divorce. Man, God must hate me. Uh, why should I even be here? Um, God, you know, is not God of love for me anymore. I, I, I don't believe that that should be the case, and I'm not going to serve, I'm not going to end the sermon here. But as R.C. Sproul once said, um, you know, he said, hard preaching uh, creates soft hearts. Soft preaching creates hard hearts. You know, hard preaching creates soft hearts because the hard preaching includes the gospel. And so the, 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 the hard preaching, and we look at God's word and what it says, as we look at it, you see the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of God's love in a messy situation like divorce. So let, let, me, let me first explain that God does permit divorce in, in a couple of instances, and then go about talking about uh, the gospel, you know, quickly. Um, because we do have a wonderful um, testimony that, that's going to be shared after I'm, I'm done here. But God permits divorce in two specific cases. 
Uh, and the Bible is clear. I, I think that the Bible is clear. Um, I know it gets, it gets messy and people disagree, but I think the Bible is clear. There, the, one instance is here. It says in verse 9, um, verse nine of, of Matthews, um, it says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife. So there, there's, there's a, there's, you can't divorce your wife. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So here in Jesus' words, there's only one instance. And, and people can debate a little bit of what this means, but I think it is, it's adultery. If, if your wife or your husband commits adultery, although God doesn't want it, God is always seeking reconciliation. That God permits in this circumstance that you can get divorced. Because adultery is so contradictory to God's covenant. And God mentions it in the Old Testament. God commits uh, adultery as people who rebel against him and breaks his covenant. So that is one clear case. Another clear case is found in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7. And I'm going to start reading from verse 14. So the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of the husband. So this is talking about believers and unbelievers. Otherwise, your children would be unclean as it is. They are holy in verse 15. But if the unbelieving uh, partner separates or leaves or abandons, if the unbeliever abandons um, the believer, let it, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. So if there is a marriage and there is a believer and an unbeliever and an unbeliever says, I don't want to be with you anymore. I want to divorce you. The believing husband or wife says, they should, and, 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 and Paul says, let it be so. I mean, that, let, that could happen. So those are the two clear instances in the Bible where it says divorce is permissible, not desirable. And I want to emphasize that. Divorce is never desirable. But those are the two instances, instances that are, and remember, it's, Jesus says it's because of the hardness of the heart of, um, of the Pharisees. Now, and, and th- that's the truth. Now, is, is that it? Like I said, is that it? Is there any hope? No, because the gospel plays a role in it, in, any, in all the situations. Remember, there's a people in here that are not married, who are single, obviously catapult kids, not married. But I don't want their, their, you know, their, their, uh, you know, their vision of marriage and divorce to be distorted by the world, thinking that divorce is okay. No, you want to fight against it. So it's a preventative thing. For, for married couples who are just getting married, you want to fight it as much as you can. I have a tons, like 20, 30 books on marriage, and almost all of them is very preventative stuff so that you don't get divorced. Most of the marriage books are like that. Um, but there's also those who are, who are considering divorce, who are, who are divorced, who are remarried. There is hope. There is the gospel. So the gospel, the simple gospel principle says that you are sinful and more flawed than you can ever possibly imagine. That's why divorce happens now. Because we are sinful and we are flawed more than we can possibly believe. But that's not the gospel. That's half of it. The other half of the gospel is that at the very same time that we are sinful and, and flawed, that we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever, ever dared hope. It is not only divorce is a sin or divorce is bad, therefore that's it. You repent and it's, you have to repent in that but. The second part of that is, even if you are divorced, that's not an unpardonable sin. There's forgiveness. There's restoration. There's redemption in that. So I want all of us to know that it's not hopeless. No one is hopeless. God doesn't abandon anyone in this room. And God loves. So if that is true, then for those who are possibly considering divorce in this room because they're having some marriage strife, think about the cross. Think about how much Christ loves you and think about how much Christ loves your spouse. 
think about the fact that you are not as smart as God. <coughs> it was God's idea for you to come together. <coughs> if you are divorced and you feel isolated or alone, Christ is there. Christ is still your husband. That's what the gospel says. Because these two are the only things. But you might say, well, what about, can I divorce if my, my spouse is, uh, is abusing me? If my spouse is neglecting me? Can I, is, is that right for me to stay in a home where I'm constantly battered by my husband? And as a, as a pastor, as a, as a man, as a person, as a human being, I would say, of course not. Get away from that as far as possible. Bible has answers for those things too. Bible has answers for if, let's say your husband is neglecting you all the time. The Bible has answers to that too. What if I don't feel love for my husband or my wife anymore? The Bible has answers for that too. But the answer is not divorce. It's not. Like I said, it gets messy because this topic's messy because we're messy. But the gospel kind of cleans it up. It says no matter what, how messy you are, Christ's love is still there. And so in this room, um, I don't want you to leave here thinking that I am a sinner and I have sinned against God and God hates divorce, therefore God hates me. No, it's very the opposite. You may have divorced, you may have sinned, but God still loves you. He wants you to repent. He wants you to come to him. But he still loves you with an everlasting love. Now, for, for those who are in this room as a church, um, how are we to look upon people who are divorced or thinking think about it? What, what is our role as a church? Well, we are to comfort and walk with them. No one in this room should feel isolated because they may have divorced. No one in this room, no couple in this room because they're having marital strife should feel alone. We as a church need to walk with them side by side, not just telling them what to do, but walking with them, praying with them. But we also need to confront them in the truth. If they're considering divorce, is it biblical? We have to tell them the truth, but always speak the truth and love. And lastly, we need to share our experiences with them. One of the, the most beautiful thing that we can see is, is, is someone speaking, they're sharing their life so we can see how God is working in them. And so we want to, so I want to um, invite someone who can do that for us today, who can share his experience. Uh, his name is Roy Kim. He is a licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, he has a uh, podcast, hosts two podcasts. One is called The, the Same Boat. He is married uh, to Jen as a proud uh, stepdaddy to Audrey, and I want to invite him right now to share his story about um, marriage and divorce. Hello, everyone. Oh, there's uh, pictures up there, too. <laughs> I didn't know I re realized that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I... Um, I'm going to share some things today that are, what they say, are descriptive uh, and not necessarily prescriptive. Uh, an example of that would be, um, you know, Abraham being polygamous. It is descriptive, not prescriptive. Uh, King David uh, committing adultery and uh, conspiring to kill the other man. Um, the husband of the lover, that is descriptive, not prescriptive. Um, so some of the things that I share um, are just my experience of what happened uh, in my divorce. And so um, I was a pastor for eight years. And uh, it was in a second generation, primarily a, primarily a second generation uh, uh, Korean American church, and um, there was a point in time after the eight years when my then wife uh, confessed that she loved another man, 
And uh, it was shocking and it was scandalous. Uh, you don't really hear too many stories of uh, pastors, uh, wives uh, committing that kind of behavior. But um, it was earth shattering for me. And as I was reflecting upon what exactly to share today, um, I realized that the whole divorce experience, I think I could categorize them or divide them up into three stages. And um, one was the actual decision, the, the wrestling to divorce or not. That was the first thing to consider. Then came this very bizarre uh, six month and one day period in the state of California. After filing for divorce, you, there's a cool off period where you can consider and reconsider and maybe go through some counseling. They don't allow you to be officially divorced right away after filing. They give you six months and one day. Very bizarre time for me. And then came the afterwards, being divorced, how do I pick up the pieces? How do I make sense of my life afterwards? And um, it's, um, there's a lot of different things that go on when you are considering to divorce or not. And I don't, I think if any one of you is going through a period like that, or if you have already gone through that, I think you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a very confusing time. It's, uh, it's soul-wrenching. Um, when I pastored, I felt like I was a very black and white thinker. And part of that realization, you know, kind of manifests itself in God, I have been serving you. I went to seminary and paid a lot of money. I try my best to preach and to do Bible studies to lead this church. And as I've been praying for this, you know, period of um, distancing between me and my wife, I'm, I'm hopeful in the prayers that he would answer, as any good Christian would be hopeful. But when I realized that my wife had betrayed me to this extent, to this shocking extent, um, it's like, that is how you answer my prayer, God? You know? Like, there's a, there's a, your world turns so upside down that you don't even make sense of, like, who God is anymore. Uh, you feel like you did everything, quote, unquote, right, but this is what you get in return. And it's a horrible way to wake up every morning is just being angry all the time. And that's what it was like. It was anger, it was stress, having to prepare for you know, grad school finals at the time. Um, I had post-traumatic images. I was imagining like what they were doing, what they had been doing, what they might continue to do. You can't, you can't erase those from your head. You know, you're, the, the, the mind is a very powerful thing, so to try to delete those is just really tough. Um, I isolated myself. You know, again, what, what pastor goes through this? So to, to think about what, what to make of the situation and what to make myself, it was very, very confusing for me. It was a, it was a true ending, a shattering of dreams. I knew that I had biblical grounds for divorce, and I guess ultimately I went ahead and did it with a quote unquote clean conscience because of that. But when you're that rageful, you're not thinking about the Bible. Most people aren't, at least I wasn't. You're just thinking about either relief or escape. And what I wanted most from her at the time was for her to say, that she loved me, that she was committed to me, that she had made the worst mistake of her life, albeit for a year, 
and that she would do anything that she could to regain my trust. Those were the things that I wanted to hear. But because I didn't hear those, I heard actually a lot of other things that were contradictory to you know, the very things that I wanted. I got to a place where I couldn't sustain this marriage by myself. And I felt like this is going to go on indefinitely. There, there just was no uh, ending to this tunnel for me. And so after many months of wrestling with this, um, I went ahead and filed for a divorce. And I entered into that six month and one day limbo period that was just awful. In this six month limbo period, um, well, let me, let me touch briefly upon what happened at the place where you finalized the divorce. So you can file remotely, but there comes a time where the two of you have to meet and sign the papers and submit them together to, to, the, uh, to the courts. Now, we didn't have a judge or anything like that. We didn't have property. We didn't have anything really to split. It was very amicable in that way. But when we met, it had been a long time since we had seen each other face-to-face. -face. And um, we were cordial with each other, which is weird. You know, you, you think about this is the person that you committed your life to, the person that you fell in love with, the person that you thought that you were going to grow old with, the person that you thought you were going to die with. And um, it's just cordial. And I remember uh, giving her one last embrace in the parking lot, wishing her well in her life. And afterwards, as I was driving home and processing this with my friend, I said, it just felt cheap. You know, the, the years that we were together and all the dreams that we stored up and it ending with an embrace in a parking lot saying, I wish you well, it just felt really cheap. And it didn't feel right. And it didn't feel fair. But at the same time, I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't sustain this marriage by myself. So it was a, it was, it was a decision that I felt like I just couldn't get out of. Um, and uh, during that time, you know, you feel so just out of sorts and so painful that you can't view any social media because all the social media posts that you, hear, that you see out there are of like happy children, um, of, uh, of people going on vacations with their families. And I had none of that anymore. Like all those dreams were shattered. So I just, I, I shut off social media. I went to the gym and just listened to angry music. Um, I, Linkin Park became a best friend during that time. Um, I, I numbed myself with various vices and um, I was very hypervigilant. I, you know, I had post-traumatic images in my head and one of them was not just replaying what they were doing but also it was me fantasizing about what I would do if I were to encounter the other man. And I scared myself. Um, I, had, I, I carried a golf club in my car, in my trunk, just in case. And I scared myself so badly that I thought, like, I really might either kill or seriously hurt him in my anger. So I, I had to leave. I had to leave SoCal. And so I, I did my internship up north, up in the Bay Area, to just get away and to protect myself from that kind of rage. And uh, it, was, it was horrible um, to not be officially divorced yet. So when someone says, are you married? I'm like, yes, but not really, right? Um, you're just kind of biding your time until that one official date rolls around. So this limbo period was awful. I didn't really know what to do with myself during that time other than to numb myself. And then once I finally became divorced, <clears throat> I did get my fresh start in the Bay Area, and it was good to be away from here. Uh, but I also distanced myself from God. I distanced myself from the church. I distanced myself from a lot of Christians because they were saying things that just weren't very helpful to me at the time. And um, 
you know, you might come across, if you yourself are divorced or, or uh, you know someone who's divorced and you realize that they are no longer in the church, this may be the reason why. They're, they're going through a lot of things and they don't know whether the church is such a safe place to process these things. And that's what I was going through. Um, and um, when I finally came around, and I'll share in a little bit how I did come around, I did enter a small group up in the Bay Area. And this small group, and this church for that matter, didn't have many divorcees at all. In fact, I never met one. And it had several hundred people in it. And the small group had like eight married couples and then me, right? So eight couples, a lot of them had kids, and me. And, oh, it sucked. <laughs> you know, it's, they just, they were a constant reminder of what I didn't have. And, like, they did their best, but they couldn't quite relate because they had never divorced. And maybe they might know some people who were divorced, but they just didn't know what I was going through. And so, and I couldn't monopolize the time by continuing to talk about my stuff. So I just, you know, I, I just enjoyed their company, you know, to the best of my ability. And I, I really do love them as, as friends. But there was something really missing in my life that I, I couldn't share with people. And the fact that there are no divorcees who really stick around in the church is really saddening to me. And um, my anger, and before I get to the anger at God, yeah, I, uh, because I was, I was in so much pain, um, you know, I would quickly go back onto dating apps. Uh, I felt like by dating women, I would be able to erase this pain. And one of the things that a lot of divorcees go through is, do I lie about my marital status? You know, maybe after date five, I'll tell them that I'm divorced, you know? But I was tempted, I was tempted to lie, but uh, I eventually just said, no, yeah, I'm divorced, and yeah, there were some people who wanted to um, try out a divorce guy, but um, yeah, it took a long time for me to meet someone that I could really uh, gel with. But my anger at God was very, very strong, and I blamed him. I thought that he should have been the one that could intervene and to kind of erase time or go back into time and make it never happen, but these are all impossible things that I expected from him. And there came one day, many, many years later, I would say about like three to four years after the divorce was finalized, where I finally got to a place where I realized Kind of like that first song that we sang today. I don't know exactly the right, the exact words, but something about like you know him being in the fire next to me. I, I realized that God was so grieved about what had happened. He's not a God who forces people to not do certain things. He he allows free will, and he allowed my ex-wife to do what she did. And I felt like that was his way of not caring about me. But if he's going to be a God who allows me free will too, then he's going to allow her to have her free will. And he grieved with me. And he was there with me even though I rejected him. And he allowed certain key people to be in my life to be in that healing process. And so as I close this testimony today, I want to share with you what were the biggest healing factors for me as you kind of conceptualize what would help potentially a divorcee in your life or whether you yourself are divorced. Um, friends standing by you even when you are raging, even when you are angry, even when you are not thinking biblically, to have friends stand with you is so important. Counseling, really, really important because a pastor just can't give their time week in, week out to you. They've got a lot of different responsibilities and <laughs> truthfully, not many pastors like counseling. <laughs> so uh, yeah, a lot of pastors admit that to me. But counselors love to counsel. Uh, and it's not like they're, they're giving advice, they're just giving you their 
predictable, consistent weekly time to help process things with you. It's very, very helpful. Um, an encounter with God that is really according to God's timeline, probably not, not according to yours or to other people's, but that, that's up to God. A time to be able to forgive. Um, since what has happened, you know, I, wasn't, I didn't think that it was possible to forgive, for, to forgive my ex-wife, but truly I've come to a place in my heart that I have made peace with that and I do wish her well. I didn't just, maybe I, I had some sort of numb lip service in the parking lot as I embraced her goodbye, but right now I actually do wish her well. And that's just God's timeline. And being in the company of other divorcees is very, very important. And that's one of the things I hope for Living Hope is that there is something about this church that is a magnet for divorcees to come here because they know that divorcees would be welcomed, that they would be restored, healed. There's a safe place for them to process their pain. Um, and hopefully that, that there would even be structures in place, such as divorce care or other things like that, where there is a place um, for divorcees to really go through uh, with the, in the company of other divorcees the process of healing that, that, that's necessary for them. So these are some of the things that I have thought about that I thought would be helpful for you, for, for you to listen to uh, from the point of view of a divorcee myself. But I'm, I realize that God recycles a lot of hurts and pains, and I am now happily remarried, and I am uh, a parent now. Um, I, I thought that that was a, a pipe dream for me after getting divorced, but I'm now a parent to a lovely uh, nine-year-old, and uh, yeah, they, this, this family is, is a real redemptive part of my story. And, um, and I do praise God for the ways that he works in very mysterious ways, even though I had to go through this kind of uh, hell and back. Um, he, is a, he is a restorative God that, um, that I hope that you will place your trust in. So allow me to pray real briefly for us.